Hi guys, welcome back to my channel, Obs and Gain Made Easy. In today's video, I'm going to discuss postpartum hemorrhage. So what is postpartum hemorrhage? Postpartum hemorrhage is blood loss of more than 500 mils following vaginal delivery or blood loss more than 1000 mils following cesarean delivery or any amount of blood loss sufficient enough to cause hemodynamic instability. So there are two types of PPH. This is based on the duration it occurs. Primary postpartum hemorrhage occurs within 24 hours following delivery. Secondary PPH occurs after 24 hours to 6 weeks post-delivery. So based on the severity of blood loss, you have minor PPH, which is about 500 to 1000 mils blood loss. Major PPH is more than 1000 mils blood loss. Severe postpartum hemorrhage is more than 2000 mils blood loss. The incidence of postpartum hemorrhage is about 2 to 8 percent of deliveries. It accounts for about 25 percent of maternal deaths worldwide, and it's the number one leading cause of maternal deaths. So, what are the causes of postpartum hemorrhage? There are four main causes of postpartum hemorrhage, and they are regarded as the four T's. The first one is torn. An atonic uterus accounts for 80 percent of the causes of postpartum hemorrhage. So in a normal situation after delivery, when the placenta detaches from the uterine wall, the uterine sinuses are supposed to close. What are the uterine sinuses? They are an extension of the uterine arteries that supply blood to the placental bed. So when the placenta is detached from the uterine wall, the uterine sinuses are exposed. So bleeding continues. But how does that bleeding stop? So the uterus starts contracting. The, this wall and this wall come together. So when they meet, the uterine sinuses close. But in a uterus that's not contracting, you find that the uterine sinuses are still open. Why? Because the uterus is not contracting. So what happens is that the uterine sinuses will continue bleeding, and that's how you have postpartum hemorrhage. So contracting of the uterus helps close off the uterine sinuses. Risk factors for atonic uterus, a grand multiparous swimming. So the more pregnancies a patient has, the more the risk for postpartum hemorrhage. Why? At each pregnancy, remember that the uterus is getting distended. So this reduces its contractility ability after delivery. So grand multiparous are associated with inadequate retraction. Retraction is the ability of the uterus to go back its an original state, which is the contracted state. Another risk factor for atonic uterus is over distension of the uterus. Because of the stretching of the uterine muscles, it can delay for the uterus to go back in its contractile phase. So a big baby, more than 4 kg, can cause over distension of the uterus. Polyhydraminous as well as multiple pregnancy can cause over distension of the uterus. Morbidly adherent placenta like placenta accreta or percreta can also cause an atonic uterus. I'm sure you've heard the midwife say, as long as there's something in the uterus, the uterus won't contract. And it's true. Okay, so in placenta accreta or percreta, there's these tissues that are embedded in the uterine wall. So as long as those tissues are inside the uterine wall, the uterus won't contract. Precipitate labor caused by hypertonic uterus can cause anatonic uterus after delivery. Uterine fibroids also delay contraction of the uterus. Anemia of an HP of less than 9 grams per deciliter also increases the risk of having postpartum hemorrhage. Remember that the uterus is a muscle and it requires adequate blood supply to perform its action. Malformation of the uterus like in a biconuate uterus. So if the placenta implants in the corneal region of a biconuate uterus, it may cause excessive bleeding. If a placenta also implants in the uterine septum of a septate uterus, it can cause excessive bleeding. Prolonged labor more than 12 hours. Remember that the uterus is a muscle, and this muscle is contracting on and off during labor. So if the labor has prolonged, the uterine muscle can actually get tired as well. So after delivery, you can have an atonic uterus. Infection like choreomyelitis can also affect the tone of the uterus. Obesity probably because it's associated with a big baby and polyhydraminous, so there's over distension of the uterus. Augmentation of labor with oxytocin also increases the risk of anatonic uterus after delivery. So it's important to continue the oxytocin infusion 
for at least one hour to four hours after delivery. General anesthesia like ketamine, halothen, or ether cause uterine atonicity. Tocolytic drugs like magnesium sulfate and nifedipine also cause uterine atonicity. Trauma to the genital tract account for 20% of the causes of postpartum hemorrhage. So tears like cervical tear, perineal tear, vaginal tears, or even a uterine rupture. And one of the causes of the trauma to the perineum or vaginal tears is overzealous episiotomy tears. Tissue is another cause of postpartum hemorrhage, like retained products of conception, like placenta tissue or membranes. A retained placenta can also cause postpartum hemorrhage as well as blood clots in the uterine cavity. So if these tissues are not removed from the uterus, the uterus won't contract. So that can cause postpartum hemorrhage. The other T that causes postpartum hemorrhage is thrombin. What do we mean by thrombin? It's blood coagulation disorders. So they can be congenital like von Willebrand disease or acquired like disseminated intravascular coagulation or patients on heparin therapy. Risk factors for coagulation disorder include severe preeclampsia, which can complicate into HELP syndrome. What is HELP syndrome? Hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelet count. Intrauterine fetal demise can complicate into disseminated intravascular coagulation. The other risk factor for coagulation disorder is jaundice in pregnancy. Other risk factors for postpartum hemorrhage include antepartum hemorrhage, either placenta previa or placenta abrupture. Inversion of the uterus, increased maternal age more than 35 years, a previous history of postpartum hemorrhage, puperosepsis is the number one cause of secondary postpartum hemorrhage. Prevention of postpartum hemorrhage. It's important to identify at-risk patients antenatally and prepare for postpartum hemorrhage before patients deliver. Antenatal preventive measures. Treat anemic patients and control blood pressures for hypertensive patients in order to prevent or delay severe preeclampsia from occurring. High-risk patients to deliver from high facilities. Blood grouping should be done on all women so that no time is wasted during an emergency. Ultrasound for placenta site to rule out air, placenta previa. If you have the facility to do an MRI scan, it can help to rule out a placenta accreta. Organize for blood in advance in high-risk patients like morbidly adherent placenta, severe preeclampsia, HELP syndrome, or patients with a previous cesarean section. Intrapartum preventive measures. Active management of third stage of labor, if done routinely, can reduce the risk of postpartum hemorrhage by 60%. Infusion of oxytocin should be continued for at least one to four hours after delivery for patients who are augmented with oxytocin during labor. Thorough examination of the genital tract for trauma like cervical tears, vaginal tears, or perineal tears. Thorough examination of placenta and membrane, so you check for placenta completeness. Avoid general anesthesia during caesarean section unless there's no other option. Avoid manual separation of the placenta in caesarean section as it increases the risk of blood loss. Close observation for the first four to six hours after delivery. Empty the urinary bladder because a full urinary bladder can actually reduce the contractility of the uterus. Clinical features of postpartum hemorrhage. So in postpartum hemorrhage, there's blood loss. So there's cardiovascular compromise. So the patient complain of dizziness or may just faint, nausea, vomiting. And when you examine the patient, there'll be pale, slow capillary refill time. There'll be tachycardic and the low blood pressure. Management of postpartum hemorrhage. Step one, call for help. So you be the team leader and then you assign duties to different personnel because you can't manage doing everything alone. You do rapid evaluation of the vital signs. You check for blood pressure, pulse, respiratory rate, and check for pallor. You put up two double large bow IV axes. At the same time, you're collecting blood for full blood count, clotting time, renal function test, liver function test, and fibrinogen levels. Cross match for three to six units of whole blood and fresh frozen plasma. Now, remember that the patient will go into shock at any time. So you have to start intravenous fluids like normal saline or ringers lactate or hemocell if it's available. You start at one liter to run in 15 minutes, then you can repeat whilst waiting for blood transfusion. You repeat oxytocin 10 international units intramuscular 
and oxytocin 20 national units in one liter normal saline to run at 60 drops per minute. You can use carbatoxin if it's available. So you start high flow oxygen 10 to 15 liters per minute. Remember in hemorrhagic shock there's risk of hypoxia to the vital organs like the brain and the kidney as well as the lungs. You catheterize to monitor the urine output. So urine output of less than 30 mils per hour should worry you, meaning the patient can go into acute kidney injury. You identify the cause of postpartum hemorrhage. You check for the tone of the uterus. You check the uterus cavity if there's retained products of conception like placenta tissue, membranes or clots. So you also have to examine for the placenta to check for completeness. Maybe the patient has a clotting disorder, so you have to see the platelet count and do a clotting time. You monitor the vitals every 15 minutes and keep the patient warm. Remember to inform your senior. Step 2. Treat the cause. So if it's an atonic uterus, continuously massage the uterus and of course you've already started oxytocin as we discussed above. You evacuate the uterus if there's any retained products of conception or any clots and you examine the placenta for completeness. If at this time the uterus has not contracted, you move on to the next step. You do an examination under anesthesia for the uterus and the genital tract. So you want to do a thorough inspection of the uterus as well as the genital tract. At this stage, you can also add misoprostol, which is 600 to 800 micrograms, which you can give pyrectal or sublingual. You give tranexamic acid one gram over 15 minutes. At this point, if the uterus has not contracted, you move on to the next step, which is you insert a balloon tampon. In. The most commonly used is a condom tampon. In. It's inserted into the uterine cavity with 200 to 500 mils normal saline. When you've done this, you apply aortic compression and put the patient in an pneumatic and tissue gamut. And also put the patient on IV antibiotics. At this stage, you are planning on referring the patient to a higher center. So the next step is surgical intervention where you take the patient for laparotomy and you apply B-Lynch compression sutures and multiple square sutures. This helps the uterus to contract. You can also ligate the uterine arteries or ligate the uterine ovarian artery branch. The last option is to do a hysterectomy. So if the cause of postpartum hemorrhage is trauma, remember that tears need to be sutured starting 2 cm above the apex. And it should be done under general anesthesia if necessary, especially if the patient is uncooperative. The best hemostatic suture is chromic guide round body and make sure to cover the patient on antibiotics when you are done. In some cases, the cause of postpartum hemorrhage is a retained placenta. So, what is a retained placenta? This is when a placenta is not expelled within 15 minutes of delivery. So, what is the first step when managing a case of a retained placenta? You assure the bladder is empty, applied controlled cord traction, and if this fails, you move on to the next step, which is you repeat oxytocin 10 international units IM or give carbatocin if it's available. If it's not successful in 30 minutes, you move on to the next step. And the next step is the manual removal of the placenta under general anesthesia. So manual removal of the placenta is done under general anesthesia. Remember to cover the patient on IV antibiotics because you'd have introduced infection in the genital tract. So once this procedure is performed, you examine the placenta for completeness. And if it's not complete, you attempt to remove the retained products of conception like the placenta tissue or the membranes which are still inside. You give oxytocin 20 international units in 1000 mL normal saline at 60 drops per minute to prevent postpartum hemorrhage and remember to monitor the vitals closely and urine output. You can also add misoprostol 600 to 800 micrograms per rectal for efficient uterus contractility. And in some cases, when you manually remove the placenta, you find out actually it was a placenta accreta or percreta. So most of these cases can end up into a hysterectomy for placenta accreta if hemostasis was not achieved. Blood coagulation disorders are difficult to manage if there's no blood products available. Either way, cross-match the patient for whole blood, fresh frozen plasma, as well as platelets. Early transfusion of fresh frozen plasma may be life-saving. You can also give tranexamic acid 1 gram over 15 minutes 
and it can be repeated after 30 minutes. The maximum dose of tranexamic acid in 24 hours is 3 grams. So for secondary postpartum hemorrhage, we said that it occurs after 24 hours till the puberum period, which is 6 weeks postpartum. And the main cause is infection like endometritis. But it's important to look out for retained products of conception and malignancies like cervical cancer or choriocarcinoma. You should perform a vagina swab as well as an ultrasound to see if there's retained products of conception or there's something else going on. So this comes to the end of our discussion on postpartum hemorrhage. Thank you for listening and please don't forget to subscribe. Thank you.